alien spacecraft did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. You know flat earthers, I guarantee it. But you don't know who they are because they're afraid of talking about it. This is not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system. Hello and welcome to the 59th annual Subliminal Deception Podcast, your weekly dose of conspiracy theory. Bullshit, my name is Cody, and I'm joined by my pal Phil. How are you doing? Doing good, buddy. How about yourself? Not doing too bad. Uh, Minnesota is finally tickling our balls and warming up, although today, for some reason, it was like 30 degrees out, but it is warming up. How is the weather in your area? It's uh, hot as fucking balls here, dude. It's uh, Yesterday, I got off work. My car said it was 117 out. But holy shit, that's how uh, hot it was inside the car. So ah. but yeah, it's been bad. <laughs> anyway, you said you had uh, some people you want to shout out. Oh, yeah. There is a uh, message that we got before we recorded uh, part two. And I just want to shout him out on Instagram. Jerome Dizzle. Uh, he sent me a message basically saying how there was a theory that King James was trying to distract the court. Because of the fact that he was gay, and that's why he was doing all the stuff with the uh, rearranging the Bible mm. and rewriting it. So I wanted to shout him out. He kind of, because uh, we didn't talk about that at all before part two, but he kind of called it. So Yeah, it's funny because after you told me that, I'm like, man, we totally called that in part two. But it became quite obvious that he... <laughs> Probably was just a gay man who wasn't allowed to just be himself way back then. It kind of makes you wonder, though, why he wouldn't add, uh, like, maybe make characters gay in the Bible or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Well, he was probably trying to run from it so hard, I imagine. That could have been it. Yeah, that that certainly could have been it. But you know what? Um, that's something I had no idea about, so it... Uh, but it definitely makes sense, you know. Yeah. So shout out Jerome Dizzle. You know, thanks for listening and thanks for the message. Anyone else who wants to message us, it's just uh, Subliminal Deception Podcast on Instagram. We love hearing from people. Heard uh, we actually got quite a good response from those two episodes. So thank you for that. Yeah, that was uh, that that was a good episode. I think that those episodes are definitely a part of like the witch hunt or witch trials, or whatever. You don't. A lot of people I don't think I've heard about. Yeah, definitely. I've been hearing a lot more stuff about witches lately, so I'm kind of wondering if that's like the thing that's coming back. Kind of replacing like zombies and werewolves. <laughs> so it's getting popular now. I mean, it, would, it wouldn't it would surprise me. I mean, I guess people still do do it where they, they like uh, kids our age, I feel like when you hear witch or whatever, you just think of... Uh, Wiccan or whatever, you know, they, you don't really think twice about it, but there's still people who hear the weird word witch and assume that it's some harbinger of doom or something. Some kind of devil worshiping, evil doing person. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of it's kind of funny, but I just realized something when I was listening to Creeper Reels newest episode about uh, the skinwalkers and like the Native Americans believes beliefs in witches and all of that. Uh, it kind of makes you wonder all the different cultures throughout history has always had a witch of some kind. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, what is that built into the human psyche? Like, we just refer to an evil person as I'm sure they didn't call it a witch, but you know what I mean? It's something that almost almost like it's universal. Yeah. Like it, there's always some kind of supernatural some kind of magic, some kind of like either good and bad force behind everything. It's yeah. kind of odd that it all kind of like that's an intersection between every culture. Well, it's kind of, it, it kind of reminds me of like the uh, people always talk about the pyramids, right? You got the pyramids in Egypt, you got the pyramids in South America. But then some people believe like humans just naturally want to create things that go up, right? Uh, yeah. So 
I don't know, maybe the witch thing is like deeply embedded in us somewhere. I don't fucking know. It's it's whatever. Yeah, that pyramid thing, I think it's a lot of to do with that's the most stable way to build a tall building is to build it really big at the bottom and thinner up as you go up. But yeah, it is odd that there's so many pyramids in history. And I mean, all these cultures intersect. I also kind of want to talk about something else, though. OK, uh, so I actually just saw a news story this morning. So I thought I'd mention it. Apparently, there are some scientists in China who think that the coronavirus might be sexually transmitted because they were finding uh, strains of the coronavirus in semen after the patients had recovered. Really? Yeah. So out of the 35 patients that they studied, seven of them had coronavirus in their semen. So they're not sure exactly how long it survives after the person gets better, but they're saying it could be sexually transmitted. Apparently, coronavirus lives in certain parts of the body that the immune system won't touch. Like there's some glands like um, around your brain. It's also in the sexual organs. So they're thinking it might be in there. Your immune system won't won't help your sexual organs. No, they won't attack your yeah, they won't attack your sexual organs. So huh. apparently coronavirus can live in there. <laughs> I want to know who volunt who which recovering <laughs> coronavirus person agreed to jerk off in a cup. That's that's who I want to know. <laughs> well, it's China, so I don't think they have to agree <laughs> to anything. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. You're you see all those reports like people who are protesting and everything, and then it's like, yeah, we were tortured. This entire time, like, oof, Jesus. Yeah, I don't think you were tortured. You're not quite Anne Frank living in a cupboard. You're in a fucking house with Netflix and you no, know, no, 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 no. I'm water. I'm not those type. I'm talking about like in China, the people who have been protesting about them lying about a lot of stuff. They oh. were then abducted by the government and tortured. Oh, in China. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I'm not talking about some people in America who are forced to watch Netflix at home. I'm talking about actual people who are really tortured for opposing yeah. the government. So Yeah, I just assume when you talk about protesters, I thought you meant <laughs> the uh, the pro-Trump supporters who want to just go right back to opening everything back up. Oh, did you see? So Michigan's been a hot spot for that, right? Yeah. Um, I, I saw uh, a news article today that all there's a whole bunch of uh, armed black people who are doing the same thing. Like they were protecting the lawmakers or something against the protesters with guns who were there. So they had guns and they were there. And then the other ones had their guns and they were there. So kind that's of interesting. super smart. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cops have guns too. Everyone just leave your guns at home. Just, <laughs> if you want to go out and say something, that's fine. Just Leave the fucking guns at home. I don't under. I'll never understand all these people who bring their guns to protests. Like that's not a good image for uh, your little your little march. It's a it's for intimidation. Yeah, and it gets you on the news too. So <laughs> that's true. Anyway, should we jump into our uh, weekly world news here? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, now before I read these ones here, I want to uh, talk about. So I remember I tagged you. In that, oh, that coronavirus cure magazine. And I tagged Weekly World News' Instagram and then Women's Health or something. Whoever published the article and they actually liked my comment or my post or whatever. So that was oh, pretty nice. sweet. Yeah. Sh hell yeah. I should email and be like, look, Subliminal Deception wants to work with Weekly World News on a weekly basis. <laughs> we will promote your magazine or something. I, I, should, I should message him and ask. Let's do it. That'd be great. Drop some change in. Hell yeah. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll start off with, uh, obviously, we always do Madam Bennett's World of the Unusual. We'll start up here. Um, this, this story is titled, Ships and Planes Vanish in a New Bermuda Triangle. Two journalists claim there is another Bermuda Triangle in the world where ships and planes have mysterious, mysteriously vanished or have been wrecked. Writers Kevin Killey and Gary Lester have named the bizarre region the Devil's Meridian. You ever heard of this place? No, I have not. 
Okay. Uh, is pinpointed in the base strat between Melbourne, Australia, and the uh, island of Tasmania. So you were mentioning the Dragon's Triangle. I That's not around there, correct? No, that's many, like, that's thousands of miles away. South, though. Yeah, so the one you're talking about, I've never heard of, but that would be, like, thousands of miles south. Because the one... The Dragon's Triangle is up near, like, China, Japan, Philippines, like that area. Right, so, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wonder if this one is actually near where, well, I don't know. I was going to say, is it near where the, uh, I can't even think the, of the name of the, the ship. The Hoida? Yeah, the Hoida disappeared or whatever. No, it wouldn't be. No. Because that was, no, that was, well, I mean, it's in the same, like, kind of, it's in the same slice of Earth. But it's not anywhere near it. It's almost like if you were saying that Hawaii was in the same location as Los Angeles. It'd be <laughs> like that. Yeah. That far okay. away. Okay, that makes sense. Anyway, one of the most famous disappearances in the Strait was that of pilot Frederick <laughs> Valentich. I assume he's a German man. Who vanished in his single engine plane in 1978 shortly after reporting that he is being followed by a UFO. In 1979, the racing sloop Charleston and, and her crew of five disappeared in the strait while on their way to compete in the yacht race near Sydney. A brand new four engine plane carrying two crew members and ten passengers vanished over the strait in 1932. The writers who put their findings in their book, The Devil's Meridian, by Lester Townsend Publishing included these and a host of other bizarre disappearances, all uh, occurring in this area. So, I thought I had heard the word Devil's Meridian before, but I guess this kind of, I don't know, I get, this, when is this issue from? I think this is from uh, 81 still march 24th 1981 so you know what it's uh it's not that old i guess no for them one of those occurrences would have been like fresh in their minds yeah if there was the one in the 70s um oh yeah two no, years never, two years yeah yeah i've never really heard of uh devil's meridian but it is kind of interesting um god that's uh it's pretty far south so hmm I wonder, maybe that's something uh, we can look into. Maybe more things have disappeared here since 1981. Yeah, that's true. Like an update to the story. No, it could be. All right, we'll do a real quick one here. Uh, golf game is saved by magic. All right. Officials of a professional golf tournament in South Africa used a bizarre method of keeping the event from being rained out. They called in a witch doctor. The officials turned to the weird use of magic when huge dark storm clouds formed uh, over the golf course at the Sun City Resort Hotel in... <laughs> I don't even know the name of this place. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's in South Africa. Fearing the <laughs> rain would spoil the event, they called in uh, Christina, a well-known sorceress at a local village. Kneeling on the turf near the clubhouse, Christina tossed onto the grass some animal bones, seashells, two car keys, and a domino while wailing an eerie chant. Incredibly, no rain fell, and American Lee Trevino won the $21,000 first prize. So congratulations, wow. congratulations, Mr. Trevino. Um... Interesting there's car keys in that <laughs> spell. But I was about to say, maybe she got called, like, right as she was walking out the door. She's like, oh, shit, and just grabbed, like, the old KFC from last night in the garbage, some car keys that she doesn't have anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, just uh, random shit. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's a weird combo. Um, we're going to do her prediction for the week real quick. Uh, the fashion world will be rocked when a Spanish clothing designer introduces mini skirts for men made from fake animal skins and furs. I don't think that took off. Could be wrong. I don't know. There was some, uh, I remember a lot of people, like a lot of dudes back when I was in college, kind of dressing a little, what's that, the metrosexual. Yeah. Uh, there was some 
people wearing some pretty weird clothes back then. But what uh, what year was this from? You said uh, 81. Yes, I suppose that would have been a giant deal back then. Yeah. Now the it, nowadays, it's not a big deal. You dress however you want to dress. But today it'd be uh, or in 1981 be a little uh, crazy, I guess. Anyway, yeah, it's, we- it's not such an unusual sight these days in bigger cities. But. Should we move on to the uh, to the story here, Phil? Yeah, let's kick it off. OK, so have you ever heard of the death chair of Thomas Busby or no. Busby's stoop chair of death? <laughs> Interesting title. So you've never heard of this thing. Um, There is God, one of those museums where they keep weird haunted items kind of like the uh the doll and some other things i do remember seeing like a chair that was kept in a glass case i'm not sure if that's the same thing though no 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 no. um that see that was my original plan was to do a bunch of death chairs but the thomas uh bubsby bubsby uh chair story is so large that it had to kind of focus on just this story. So, but it's a very fascinating one and it has, I don't know once we get to the end, we'll ask you if you think this is just a string of coincidences or if this actually might have a curse on it, but we'll start off here. The story begins way back in the 17th century century where a money counterfeiter named Daniel Otty I think that's how it is. A W E T Y. I think it's Aughty. Aughty. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good enough. <laughs> Lived in the small town of Kirby Whisk, a little to the northwest of Thirsk in North Yor- Yorkshire, England. Uh, any idea of any of these locations, Phil? No, never. <laughs> I've heard of Yorkshire, but I've never heard of any of those locations. It actually sounded like. From a, a more detailed uh, description of the area that I didn't include here, that it might not have been that far away from where you lived. Okay. So maybe more south, but it was in the like northeast corner of uh, England, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, that's around where I was living. So <clears throat> it might be. Anyway, now Daniel Otty had moved into an, an old farm. Uh, he came to call Dot... <laughs> Danity Hall, not sure why he calls it that. Uh, here he built a large hidden underground room to conduct his illegal activities. Now, Daniel also had a daughter named Elizabeth who would come to fall in love and marry a local man named Thomas Busby. After their marriage, Thomas and Daniel began to work together on their uh, in Daniel's counterfeiter counterfeiting ring so uh they had i don't know if you've heard this before but it seemed like the brits had a different term instead of counterfeiting they call it like a snipper or something i've never heard of that term a spinner or something like that i know god what was it like when coins were actually made out of real silver i know that that when you you would call it snipping when you would take a little piece of the silver off the sides of the coin and sell it separately. Hmm. So maybe it kind of came from that old term into counterfeiting money. I That could be. It's fucking 1700s. So who fuck knows? But uh, yeah. but yeah, apparently this was this was their career choice is to uh, <laughs> counterfeit money, I guess. Anyway, now there was a little issue with Thomas Busby. Uh, he loved to drink just a little too much. After a while, Elizabeth and Thomas uh, would move out of Daniel's house and move into a local inn named the Busby Stoop Inn, which was great for Thomas because he lived here and he could get shit-faced here, right? Excellent for an alcoholic. Now, for reasons unknown, Daniel came down to the inn one night Uh, that his daughter was at and demanded that she come back home with him. But Elizabeth said, I'm not going anywhere until Thomas has returned to the inn. Well, when Thomas finally returned home, he was absolutely shit-faced, which should come as no surprise for an alcoholic, right? No, anyone living in uh, England, you know, 
<laughs> you're just gonna come <laughs> home shit faced every once in a while. It's fine, especially in the 1700s. You got yeah, you had to definitely. Now the two men engaged in an argument uh, because his uh, Daniel said he didn't want his daughter married to a drunk. Okay, he's responsible. Now Thomas was obviously very upset as well, but he wasn't upset that Daniel had came come to take his wife away. What Thomas was upset about was that Daniel had been sitting in his favorite chair okay you do not sit in thomas's chair that's so, my chair that's my batman cup <laughs> <laughs> don't even think about playing with my drums you ever had a favorite chair phil uh i grew up in a large family so yes we all had our our spots okay very right. much do you think you would uh, curse a chair i don't think i would curse a chair maybe a person but <laughs> that's a different story <laughs> anyway now being that Thomas was fucking furious. Uh, he decided to make the three-mile journey to Daniel's house, where he then proceeded to bludgeon Daniel to death with one of the counterfeiting hammers. Soon they discovered, uh, you know, a few days later, whatever, they discovered the grisly murder of Daniel, and Thomas was promptly arrested. And then he was uh, found guilty of murder and was set to be hanged. Now, this is where the legend starts to begin. Um, While Thomas Busby was walking up to the gallows, he proclaimed that anybody who dare sit in his favorite chair will find themselves dead. That was his little, I don't know, death curse he put on the chair or whatever. I don't know. What do you think of it so far? So I was just trying to get one thing straight. Was it the father-in-law who killed the son-in-law or the son-in-law who killed the father-in-law? Sorry, it was the son-in-law who killed the father-in-law. Okay, so it would have been his death curse. You, correct. He, Be- he cursed right before he died. Right. Yes. Uh, Thomas okay. was married to Daniel's daughter. Uh, Thomas was apparently so mad Daniel was sitting in his chair. He killed him. Uh, when he was arrested, they they hung him, and uh, on his way to the gallows, he said, anybody who sits in my fucking chair will end up dead. Yeah, it's crazy that he killed him with the, you said the hammer that they used yeah. to, I thought that when you said counterfeiters, I, am- I automatically thought that you meant like the notes, like the, the paper currency. But um, I think that what they used to do is they would take two hammers and put a blank in between the hammers and then smash them to make the coins. So it's crazy that he would like use something that was could be like put back to him or maybe he just didn't care about getting caught. Well, my my assumption is is that he was shit-faced here, right? So Oh, I he forgot. He probably that. wasn't really paying attention when he murdered him. If a shoe would have been closer to him, he would have grabbed the shoe and killed him with the fucking, yeah. Just yeah. whatever was near him. It, the the main point of the uh, the kind of the build up to the legend here with the the crime is that we assume he's mad because they sat in his chair. But when you're dealing with two criminals and an alcoholic, I assume he could have been mad about a number of things. Oh yeah, I'm sure it built up to that. Yeah. So who knows if it's really just about the fucking chair? But the chair becomes absolutely infamous at this point. So af- now after the execution, the owner of the inn, right, where they the argument started, uh took Thomas's chair and just put it <laughs> just put it up on display and would charge people to come like look at the murder chair, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it, the his cursed chair or whatever. Um, and it's pretty well known that the owner of the inn was a swindler. So he figured I can make a few bucks off this. Whatever gets the asses in the seats. <laughs> if you don't have the world's largest fucking ball of wine in your town, you gotta, you know, if you don't have the world's largest ball of twine in your town, you gotta come up with something. <laughs> Bring in the customers. Now, you know, what's interesting about this is obviously right now, 
and I'm included in this, is that uh, the true crime is very big uh, around the world right now. But uh, if you pay attention to, like, old stories or whatever, all throughout history, people have had a morbid uh, curiosity, right? So, seeing... Oh, like, definitely. There's a reason why Jack the Ripper became so huge. Right. And it's, it, it's it like... It start. It's, it's like this guy's putting up this infamous chair uh, and making money off of it. And it's just like, it shouldn't be shocking at all because people would do this shit constantly. Yeah. And there's also a, like a curiosity with cursed objects, mm. kind of like the, uh, the Egyptian curse that we were talking about. Right. Right. Many episodes ago that, that became huge also. So I know it, it was fun. Well, my, my whole idea for this story was like, let's find some more cursed objects and uh, obviously, there's a lot of them. I plan on covering them in the future. But King Tut's tomb is always like on the top ten list of like cursed objects. Yeah, it's uh, that was a really interesting story. I enjoyed doing that podcast. I, I feel this, like I feel like we kind of debunk that one. Yeah, it. I mean, the thing about it is, obviously, you know. There's a lot of shit that gets built up for money and stuff like that. Like you said right away, this guy was propping the chair up just to make a dime. So who knows? But I mean, I don't know. It's almost better for the legend just like having these things, even though they're true, they're not true, whatnot. It makes for a good story. All I know, Phil, is when subliminal deception gets big, we're going to start collecting conspiracy objects and we're going to have a subliminal deception uh museum everybody can come visit a cursed museum oh yes <laughs> that's all i ever wanted <laughs> yeah i just want the monkey paw that grants the wishes that's all i want that'd be great <laughs> i want brendan Fraser's acting career in there that's where i want <laughs> Kept in a small box. <laughs> we'll get a locket of like Gordon Ramsay's hair and Barry Sotero's hair, Paul Hogan's hair. We need all of them. Yeah. <laughs> make a wi- make a wig out of it. Put it on. You shape shift. That'd be great. No, anyway. Now, we don't know the exact number of deaths related to said chair. Um, I'm going to be going through some of the stories here in a second. But one website I was reading through, they estimate, okay, I'm quotationing here, that it could be up to 63 people who have died after sitting in this chair. Holy shit. That's an estimate. Could be sensationalizing, but that's an estimate, okay? We don't don't know anything else there. So how long was this killer chair active for? So you said the 1700s. Yep. Up till the present day. It still exists. Oh, shit. Okay. You can literally go see this chair right now if you want to. And I'm going to tell you where to do it at the end of the episode. But, uh, but yeah, this thing still exists. You can still go see it right now if you want to. Do you win a free meal from that pub if you sit in the chair? <laughs> it's actually not at a pub anymore. I'm going to talk about oh, okay. that in a second here. I was gonna say they give you a free eight pound like a meat pie, just to, just to sit in that chair. Probably oh, get, I got a free meal out of it. Then you get fucking run over by some drunk on your way home. You get a free plate of unsalted food, British style. <laughs> British style. Food. Yeah, yeah, zero flavor. We don't like flavor in this country. <laughs> yeah. Could you? Do you have some pepper I could put on that? You get the fuck out of here. <laughs> what the hell is pepper and s- salt? What the hell is that? <laughs> anyway, now keep in mind, this, what I'm about to tell you, is the first reported death associated with a death chair. And uh, that is that of a chimney sweep who, along with a friend, sat in the chair while having a drink one evening in 1894. Now, the sweep never made it home that night Being completely inebriated, he laid down on the road to sleep. The next morning, his body was found hanging from the post next to the gibbet, which is uh, what they apparently call where you go hang people. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like like the stocks or the gallows? Yeah, the gallows. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, apparently, I had to look up what a gibbet 
was apparently it's the British way of saying a gallows. I guess I I don't fucking know. They have weird words for everything. They do. They do. I feel like a gibbet is is that what uh, our parents would call the inside of like chickens when you oh, cook like them? Oh, like a jib- giblet. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So basically, uh, this lad. Chimney sweeps a horrible enough job. I'm just going to throw that out there. But he was shit-faced. Apparently, he laid down in the road to sleep, which is never a good idea. But when they found his body the next day, he was hanging uh, on a post that was next to the gallows. I should mention, too, the pub has gallows next to it. But at this time, I don't know if it's the real ones or if it was like a mock one of what they used to have there. Oh, you mean like in the modern day? Yes, 1894, oh, okay. it is 1894, but I don't know if they had the real ones still there, but when the pub was still running, they had the fake ones there. Yeah, if this guy would have just died in the middle of the street without anyone knowing, um, I think Edgar Allan Poe <laughs> died from uh, like poison, not poisoned alcohol, but alcohol back then was really unregulated and people would die all the time. But they wouldn't really die. They would just be like in a coma. But yeah, it's kind of strange that I don't know how a curse would cause someone to be hung from a pole. I think what they're leaning on here is that he sat in Thomas's chair. Thomas has got uh, hanged. And this is his way of getting revenge for the kid or however old this guy is sitting in his chair. So he died the same way Thomas died. I think that's what they're pointing at. It wasn't just an overzealous executioner no. looking to put in some overtime. No. Because those guys got to eat, too. That's true. Hey, that's true. That is true. Anyway, uh, this next one's going to hit close to home, I think, Phil. Uh, in 1967, two young RAF pilots sat in the inn one night, daring each other to sit in that fucking chair. Eventually, one of them caved in and placed his backside on the chair just for a second. On their way back to the field, they both died when their car ran into a tree. Uh, They weren't dead initially, but they died at the hospital later on. So, two Air Force, Royal Air Force pilots died after uh, sitting in the chair. What do you think of that one? That's pretty crazy. Um, That pub, I mean, the pub (laughs) that... The, the couple of pubs that I went to in the town that I lived in had been around for hundreds of years. But it's amazing that not only did they keep like that pub in the same place and it stayed a pub, but the chair was still there after like, Ooh, what, 200 yeah. years? Oh, yes. We're going to learn the chair doesn't move for quite a while yet. Yeah, that chair got a lot of miles <laughs> for, the, for the pub owners. I think the, we got the about, generations. We got either two or three more deaths here so coming up wow all right yeah (laughs) Yeah, that's that's i mean car accidents are something that just kind of happen but it is an odd coincidence that you know one happened to touch his ass against the seat for just a little bit (laughs) and and then he ends up getting in a car accident i they actually have a picture of the car accident like they smash head first into that fucking tree well, you remember how dangerous those fucking roads are out there. No one should true. drive on those. That, that's those, true. That is those true. Those fucking roads were only wide enough for like one, like an old horse and buggy, like back in the old days. I don't see how they haven't widened those fuckers, but yeah. <laughs> it's probably expensive, I imagine, at this point. Yeah. Anyway. They figured the Romans made them good enough in the first place. <laughs> anyway, uh, in 1968, a year later... The uh, Busby Stoop Inn was taken over by Tony Earnshaw, who claimed uh, he was not a superstitious man. And basically, in his mind, the uh, Busby chair legend was nothing more than a bunch of fucking hooey, right? Yeah. But but after a few more deaths, uh, he would begin to change his tune. Throughout the early 1970s, the chair seemed to claim a number of victims, including a cleaning lady who is diagnosed with a brain tumor after knocking into the chair, a number number of cyclists and motorcyclists who suffered fatal road accidents, a hitchhiker who was ran over after having spent two nights at the pub, and a local man who died of a heart attack shortly after sitting in 
the chair. Okay, so he bought it, left the chair there, and all these random people are dying. Okay, but he's still he's still not putting it away yet. Now, mm. a group of builders having a drink at the pub uh, talk the youngest of their group into sitting in the chair. Now, back at the site, the man ended up falling through the roof of of the building they were working on and landed directly on the concrete floor, killing him instantly. Or So he died, okay? I don't know if it was instantly, but he died. So it probably wasn't a good idea for him to go directly to work after going to the pub. <laughs> well, they don't they didn't say if it was a, right afterwards, but it's Britain, so I assume it is right afterwards. It was uh the old style of taking your lunch break and pounding three beers <laughs> on your 45 minute lunch break. In Britain, are you allowed to like drink on your lunch breaks? Um, in Bury St. Edmunds, there's a famous pub. It's the smallest pub in the world. It's called the Nutcracker. And it became like, basically it was just a tiny little shop. And what they would do is they would have to go beers mm. for people on their lunch breaks. They would grab a beer and then go back to work and drink it on the way. Okay. All right. Well, is, is it a uh, Germany or Belgium where like they drink on their lunch breaks? Well, they drink all the time. Well, but yeah, I think they do drink during their lunch breaks. I don't think one beer's going to kill anybody. No, it's not. But if you're dealing with construction and you're on a high up building walking around on a roof, you might want to be a little bit sober <laughs> for that. I mean, I can only assume what are what are uh, English roofs made out of, Phil? Thatch. <laughs> there you Hay, go. Hey, pretty much. <laughs> so maybe not safe to walk on that. Not, not all Ingr English roofs and not now, but there are there are some old buildings uh, that I'd seen that were still made out of thatch. So, mm. Well, maybe that's what happened to this poor son of a bitch. Anyway, now after this poor construction worker died, uh, Tony Earnshaw decided that's enough coincidences or deaths related to the chair. So he decided I'm just going to put it in the in the cellar and it won't be able to hurt anybody. Right. Keep yep. it out of everybody's uh, sight. But not long after, a dr delivery man from a local brewery just happened to be down in the cellar, I'm assuming stocking beer there or whatever, and he decided, oof, had a long day, I need to sit. He sat in the fucking chair, okay? Afterwards, yep. when he came back upstairs, he told Tony uh, Earnshaw that that chair was just way too comfortable to just be having sitting down there not being used. After that, he got in his van and he left, and he just so happened to end up veering off of the road, and it killed the poor poor delivery man. Okay. That's just bad karma. He was slacking off at work. <laughs> I know. You can't, you can't be taking unnecessary breaks. Come on. Yeah, and he was probably dipping into the sauce a little bit, I imagine. <laughs> all brewery, even the driv delivery drivers, all brewery workers do it, so. Look, I record Bumblebub Podcast with Jordan, and he used to work at a brewery. I know you taste the product a little bit. Oh, yeah, you got to make sure it's good <laughs> two or three times <laughs> just to make sure, yeah. <laughs> anyway, after that, now Tony's had enough. After that incident... Uh, Mr. Earnhardt decided to ask the Thirsk Museum to take the chair off of his hands, okay? Now, mm. apparently, they picked up the chair and kept it under a tight security while they were transporting it because they didn't want anybody to even come in contact with this goddamn chair, which makes me wonder, did the people touching the chair to move it? Did something happen to them, or was it only if you're like... You do something like bump it, sit into it, you know, disrespect it, I guess. Yeah. Well, if you use it kind of as it's a chair, maybe. Like maybe they had poles that they picked it up by or. That's right. That could be. They didn't actually physically touch it. They just did something. Yeah. Like poles or or something. I don't know. Hire hire a Welshman to pick it up and carry it. I don't know. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Yeah, they they just hired one of the local drunks. Yeah, <laughs> you're probably gonna get in a fucking car accident anyway. Why don't you Why don't you come out here and fucking pick it up for us? Anyway, uh, the Thirsk Museum 
uh, would place the chair six feet in the air and they would allow nobody to sit in it no matter how much they beg. And apparently even the museum staff uh, aren't even allowed to touch it. Now this is what I'm saying that this chair is still available at the Thirsk Museum. You can go see it. You can do whatever. You can't touch it. You can't do nothing. But it is sitting on the wall. I'm a little worried. What if Dirk Nowitzki comes oh. into that pub? Oh, no, it's in the museum right the now. Museum now. Shit. What if he comes into that museum and thinks, ah, oh, finally, a chair tall enough for me to sit on? <laughs> he just sits up there? Yeah, he just sits up there. Is Something he... happens to the national treasure. Is he a Brit Germany. or is he the Greek guy? He's Dirk Nowitzki? I yeah. think he's German. Okay. All right. I, I f- you should have went for Yao Ming. Isn't he taller? No, yeah, he's taller. <laughs> I think he, uh, yeah, no, he, I don't think he plays. I think he's living in China right now. I think he is big in the Chinese basketball league. Oh, from what I heard. okay. Go, go Yao Ming. You're pretty yeah. sweet. Actually. He made a shit ton of money. Yeah. He was pretty good, right? Yeah. Oh, he was really good. The problem is he had been pro since he was like a teenager. Mm. And being that tall, his knees and his joints were fucking worn out by the time he got to the NBA. Oh, poor bastard. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so Cooper Harding, manager of the tiny Thirsk Museum, said, We have a duty to respect our benefactor's wishes. Over the years, I have been requested many times to allow visitors to sit in the Busby chair. Uh, Mr. Harding added, In 2014, a Japanese film crew got so upset when I refused them permission to sit in the chair. They complained to the head of legal services at County Hall in North Allerington and later inquired what penalty would they incur if they disobeyed our rules. They told us the penalty is death. We could have made a lot of money for the museum if we had let the visitor sit in the chair, but a promise is a promise. So, you, Mr. Harding, you are not sitting in this fucking chair. You have to get through Mr. Cooper Harding if you want to sit in that goddamn chair. Film crew, they he, he doesn't even care how rich you are. You're not sitting in that fucking chair. I'm sure that the film crew would have gotten a snide remark, a filthy look, <laughs> probably a backhanded compliment. <laughs> a really that's pretty. usually that's usually the penalty for pissing off a British person. <laughs> it is interesting. It kind kind of what I gathered is that um, the Japanese film crew they wanted to make a movie about the curse of the chair. That's why they wanted to like I don't know sit in it or use it in their movie or something. I don't know. That's what it sounded like. I don't know if that's actually uh, what it is or whatever. Yeah, most of the uh, Japanese documentaries that I see on the internet, whenever they use a chair, don't uh, you don't want to sit in it after. So <laughs> what if he would have let him sit in it? Shit. What if he would have let him sit in it and then, then like literally all of them died? <laughs> or the plane that they were taking back fucking just fell out of the sky. That even final destination shit. That would have been yeah. crazy. Yeah, I don't know. That's they tried. I to, mean, they tried to fucking like circumvent the laws of the museum by going to the fucking legal, like the law law itself. And they're like, you motherfuckers are not sitting in that goddamn chair. Yeah. Don't want to cause an international incident. <laughs> what if that was like the na- that was World War Three <laughs> between Jap- Japan and uh, Great Britain, Great Britain, just because they wanted to sit in the chair. Yeah, that would be an odd thing for the history books. <laughs> if, if World War Three was caused by a Japanese film crew not being allowed to sit in a supposedly haunted chair. <laughs> That's the Franz Ferdinand moment. That <laughs> starts the end of uh, the world. You never know. Yeah. Any, anyway, um, now, the, the, Buzz, the Busby Stoop in... Was still around, as I mentioned, but in the building is still there. But for but now it is called the Jaipur Jaipur Spice, um, and I I don't really know. It, it's a it's a uh, Indian restaurant now. I'm fairly certain. Oh, okay. Yeah, they love Indian food. <laughs> but uh, which is kind of uh, I mean, it seemed like the pub had been running. 
for three over 300 years. And I don't know if they just sold it off or whatever. The building's still there, but when it was running, they still had the the uh, Busby Stoop Chair sign. That was their sign, right? And then yeah. they, like I mentioned before, they had a mock set of gallows sitting right next to the building. So it was kind of like a tourist attraction thing, I guess. Yeah, they like they turned it into something that people would want to come see, like a historical kind of site. Right. Now, hmm. this kind of made me wonder, was it the original kind of shyster in owner who did all of this? Or was it the modern one who did all of this? Don't really know. Yeah, I would be I wouldn't be shocked, I should say, if it had turned out that the chair wasn't as old as they claimed it was. Ah, you're on to something here, and I'm about to get into that in a second here, Phil. Okay. Um, we're, we'll kind of get into the debunking part of it, if you want to call it that. Now, you remember the chimney sweep I talked about uh, being found hung in uh, uh, next to the gallows or whatever, right? Yep. Now, his death was ruled as a suicide initially, but apparently, in 1914, the friend with whom the chimney sweep had spent uh, his last hours drinking with, admitting on his deathbed that he had actually robbed and murdered his friend. Nothing to do with the chair, allegedly. This is what his drinking buddy said. That's That makes a little bit more sense in the, uh, he's an asshole friend. That's a pretty shitty oh, thing to do. Absolutely. Why would you bother robbing a chimney sweep? You know how much money he makes. Not much. I maybe the I I mean there's no good reason to rob anybody but maybe they are both really poor at the time or I don't know maybe he got a bonus for extra chimney swept that month I don't know yeah could be maybe he had stolen some of his business or a higher end client <laughs> now um, another thing here is the history of York was published in 1858. Now, they have records of the murder of Daniel Autie in 1702, right? And his burial was on June 7th, 1702. But it doesn't have who murdered him in there, okay? Now, they have records of one of Thomas Busby's accomplices, Christopher Shaw's, being hung for a different murder on August 4th, 1702 in the Thirks. Thirsk Cemetery. So what people believe, this kind of sounds weird, but basically what they think is, is that Daniel Autie was murdered in 1702 and Christopher Shaw's was hung for a different murder uh, uh, the same year. And they think because it was so old, somehow they got mushed together as Thomas Busby had murdered Daniel Autie. Does that make sense? And he oh, was hung. Yeah. He was hung, but it was actually Thomas Busby's friend who got hung. And it was something that was for something completely different. It, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. There's a lot of old, like those old legends, like passed down situations, always get you know, like that game of telephone. Right. Everything changes a little bit. Changes a little bit. Somebody asks a question, like, "Well, who?" who got hung for it who killed him oh it was this guy and it was really you know a third party got hung for a different murder of someone else actually i even made a little mistake here shaw's was hung for the murder of somebody in their little book that says d naughty so maybe that was them miswriting <laughs> daniel naughty because in the in the book it says d uh period n o t t y he, I don't know. He killed a he killed a small time rapper. <laughs> D naughty. I'm D naughty, bitch. No, uh <laughs> I'm D naughty. I make fucking money. <laughs> so he could have murdered somebody else, or they mispronounced or misspelled Daniel Hottie's name. I don't really know. Somewhere there's a mix em up in this whole fucking thing. I don't know. But it makes you, you know, modern thinking from something written in seventeen oh two or records from 1702 really makes you wonder like this could have been a whole mix em up or his middle name was an N and they just misspelled his last name 
It definitely could be. I don't know. Maybe it's pronounced naughty or aughty. I don't, I don't really, whatever. Weird British name. I don't know. Now, a final little piece that you kind of uh, foretold here was uh, about the chair itself. Now, Dr. Adam uh, Baet, a renowned and respected furniture historian with the with a research research fellowship at the Victoria and Albert Museum, said the Bubsy Stoop Chair is a type now known as a caster chair because of its association with the chairmaker John uh, Shadford. Shadford worked in the North Lincolnshire town of Caster between 1843 and 1881. Now, it is unlikely that the chair is older than 1840 and was still being made up until uh, the uh, up until 1900. So we think the belief is that the chair is from 1702, but this guy says that there's no way this particular chair could be any older than 1840. Yeah, first of all, hearing that this guy is a furniture historian, <laughs> he must take that shit to the clubs and just be swimming in pussy. I was going like, to say, he gets wow. so many chicks, it's not even funny. Just fucking rolling up. Yeah, <laughs> I can't even imagine. You found your um, dream job, I see. Oh, yeah, definitely. You could really, really fucking find yourself a nice little one bedroom basement apartment for that kind of uh, <laughs> that kind of job. Um, yeah, I, that's kind of what I was thinking originally was like what I was in my mind thinking, what kind of a chair would someone in the 1700s sit on? And that one dude said, oh, yeah, that chair is so comfortable. Why don't you keep it upstairs? In my mind, a chair from the 1700s wouldn't be comfortable at all. No. Like, I mean, it's probably it's probably got a fucking jagged nail sticking up out the ass, you know, like I would assume it's just like a plank. Yeah, like <laughs> a like a busted up stool. Something but, they made out of an old horse trough. Um, You should look up uh, a picture of this chair real quick. It, it basically to me looks like the type of chair we had when I was a child in my parents house that nobody wanted to sit in. Because it's an old, wooden, creaky fucking chair that's uncomfortable. Was it that one that was sitting in the corner of, like, the dining room? <laughs> kind of does look like that, actually. Just okay, a, yeah. an old, worn-out goddamn chair. Yeah, kind of like the... Like, I know your parents keep around, like, those old, weird, antique shit, too. That was my dad. He he did a lot of that. <laughs> it's, it is kind of funny when you look back in history and they talk about, like, some of the king's thrones. And they're like... In the stories, like, oh, this was the finest chair in the land. It was made, blah, blah, blah. And then you see a picture of, like, a recreation of it or a painting, and it's just, like, a stool. Like, <laughs> it's not even – it's it's basically just a normal-looking chair with kind of a higher back, and that's it. Now now it's like, okay, you see that chair, and there's probably, like, ten dead people associated with just crafting it. And now you can get that chair from Ikea and put it, put it together yourself. In 15 minutes? Yeah. Um, I'm going to finish up with the last thing, and then we're going to get to uh, our personal opinions on this story. So apparently, there was a change.org petition to have this chair burned, and it actually had 42, 42 supporters, but uh, it closed because apparently it didn't get enough supporters. So, mm -hmm. Phil, uh, what do you think, what are your personal feelings about the uh, Bubsby, or busby chair do you think it's cursed do you think it's just a string of coincidences that people died when sitting in it what do you think i think it's just a string of coincidences um i, I always you know do but uh it is kind of weird how they have like little theories that if you believe in something enough or if enough people believe in it then it kind of becomes true um Topa. what's that they call that a tulpa. A tulpa? Is that when people, like, like you, someone's faith in something creates it? Yeah. Like, okay. ba ba basically, let's say our podcast created, like, uh, a new creature or something, right? And then enough people started believing that it actually exists, and they believe that they're seeing it. The theory is, is that a tulpa's created where it's like a psychic... Psychic manifest manifestation of enough people believing it actually exists. 
So if Gordon Ramsay really did start eating human flesh, yeah, he pro- <laughs> that would be us creating that. Right, right. That That's the theory. Uh, it's basically where enough people think it actually exists like you people think it into existence. Yeah, that's, I mean, that could possibly be it if that sort of thing was true. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's also, I mean, it seemed like it was a moneymaker for what 200 years so i wouldn't doubt if we're just keeping that around and people really believed in it and maybe these maybe those deaths weren't exactly like right after because you were kind of saying like how that guy died after he sat after he the youngest guy in the construction crew you said he died falling through the roof after he sat on the chair yep and it's like well did he go (laughs) drinking at the bar then crawl up to the roof and it's like well we don't know if he died right away it's like well did someone die maybe weeks later and they're like oh he his ass touched the chair <clears throat> that's what killed him you know well they all these death stories have something connecting them all together and that is alcohol yeah that's true because <laughs> it was at a pub so i mean what what else you know you're not going to go to a pub and order tea well here but. here here's kind of what i'm thinking is that Okay, this guy had purchased the the pub or the inn or whatever uh, from the old guy. Maybe the old guy had heard about the the hanging and murder, and there's a long game of telephone that this was his chair. He's he told the other guy that uh, the inn has the legend of the chair. He bought it. He kind of, but everybody kind of knew about the legend and then people started dying and he assumed it was real in all of this. It was kind of a selling point, like you said, to come to this particular pub or inn and it's kind of just a legend that's grown and grown and grown and people believe it's real and it kind of became an attraction and now it's gone, I guess. It's in the museum or what. It's kind of like a really long game of telephone or something that has been a myth that's existed forever, but people don't actually, people have died when sitting in it, but it's just a coincidence. Yeah. I would say I would mark it down for coincidence. Um, you, how many people did you say died? Like 60? Well, they, they, the legend is 63 people, but for the actual stories they have, it's maybe like five to 10. Okay, so most of the stories are modern. Right, right. Oh, okay. That they, that they yeah. still have, like, actual... I'm assuming the people actually did die after sitting in the chair, but we don't know if the chair is the cause of it. Yeah, it's one of those deals where everyone, like, the oldest people, like, oh, I remember hearing about that story in 1700. And it's like, well, is there, of course, any histories anyone around anyone write anything down no but i remember being told that by my drunk grandpa that that <laughs> chair kills people like now kind he, of like that old game of telephone where yeah yeah now here's a that. real question if you had an opportunity to sit in the chair would you do it um it's, it's yeah it's, it's interesting because that thought's always in the back of your head like what if why would i risk it like and i think that's also you're looking for your imminent death Kind of that final destination thing. Right. How they were always looking for the the chick who ended up in the nut house, and she didn't allow anyone to wear belts or shoelaces or anything when they came in to see her. You're always looking for your own imminent death, like right around the corner. Right. That's that's a good point. Well, anyway, Phil, if anybody wants to email us, well, you should you should email or message us. Tell us if you would sit in this fucking chair. Where can they do that, Phil? They can hit us up on our email, subliminaldpodcast at gmail.com. Like I said, uh, we just got a few really good messages from some of our fans for our past couple episodes. Uh, Our Dear David episode, three episodes ago, we got a lot of great messages. That was on our Instagram, uh, at subliminaldeceptionpodcast on IG. Cody and I also have our own. Mine's stpodphil. I check it a little bit more now than i used to but still not a lot cody you've got a couple yeah you can follow my personal instagram at cody zibub uh just follow me uh talk with me do whatever uh anyway the last thing we need you to do if you could is to log on to itunes 
and leave the show a five star review. Doesn't really matter what you say, just type some horse shit in there. Uh, and we'll be eternally grateful to you. The other thing you can do is if you are a Spotify user, just log on to Spotify, hit that follow button, and you'll always be updated when we drop an episode. Uh, that apparently is their version of reviews. I don't know if that's confirmed or not, but just do it anyway. Uh, they other- love that money. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you next week for another conspiracy. Thanks, guys. <laughs>